Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. First Timothy chapter six. Timothy, a young man going into the ministry, trained by Paul. This letter is written to ministers like Timothy, their conduct, the way of the church, what they're to do. And chapter six hits another topic of preaching, the rich. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Employees, your boss, you are to treat with honor and respect. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemy. We'll find this in Titus chapter 2 verse 5. Listen, you proclaim yourself to be a Christian and you mistreat your boss. People are going to look at you like... Who do you think you are? What do you think you are? You, you proclaim to be God instead of God, and you act like that, your conduct's like that. You're no different from the world. And they that have believing masters, if you got a saved boss, saved master, let them not despise them, because they are brethren. But rather do them service. Just because your boss is saved doesn't mean you are exempt from working. Because they are faithful and beloved by God. Partakers of the benefit. Oh, look at that. Benefits and job. These things teach and exhort. What? Timothy, you get in that pulpit. And one of the things you teach, you're supposed to teach about the employee relationship with the boss. And the employee relationship if he's got a saved boss. There's many things to preach about. If any man teach otherwise. Well, you know, you don't need to work. You, you can just sit back and, you know, sit at the water cooler and do what you want to do. It's your own time. And, you know, you know, when you are charged 40 hours, you ought to do 40 hours of work. If you don't, it's stealing. And you better repent and get right. First John 1 John 1.9 is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ as wood, hay, or stubble. And there are going to be people out there who are going to teach their congregations, teach the people, and you don't have to submit to those people. How dare you mention the word masters? That has a bad condensation of the history of our people. Revolt. Arise. And flee. I have a dream. And God says, Any man otherwise consent not to the wholesome words, verses 1 and 2, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, the teaching which is according to godliness. So Jesus taught this too. He's proud. I'm going to say this. I say every time the word pride or proud comes, that has nothing in relationship with God. That does not belong out of a pulpit or a Christian. I'm proud of my son, or I got pride in my house, or proud to be American. That's not God. So when somebody says you rise up against your master, someone's proud and they're not on the side of God. We can go rewrite the history books back to where it should be. 
Now, slavery is wrong, but it's in the Bible, and it says you're to obey your masters. So the American public school system is teaching its people wrong. You get offended, you get offended at God and his teaching. Knowing nothing, how do you like that one? I don't care what uh, letters you have before and after your name, doctor, PhD, and all that. You don't know nothing. You don't know what the Bible says. There were laws about a master-servant, servant-master relationship. We're coming up on a book called Philemon. Mean, wicked, nasty, devilish Philemon had a slave that ran away on Nassus. Problem? Philemon was a saved man and respected by Paul. And Paul got to Onassis, and Onassis was a runaway slave that got saved under Paul's teaching. And the law said if you had a runaway slave, you're not to turn him on to back to his master. He sends Onassis back with a letter called Philemon. Uh, Sir, this guy is yours. He's not who he used to be. Join him as our family. We'll, we'll get to that letter. But listen, slavery is in the Bible. So anybody of any particular race proclaims out of their pulpit, out of their church, the evils of slavery don't know their Bible. And they forget that the first slavery that appeared in the Bible was the color man taking full advantage of the Jewish man, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You did forget Exodus, didn't you? You did forget that all that God had done to get that nation out of Egypt, man, God had to put on plagues and wonders, and Pharaoh would not give them up. In the Bible, Israel, God's people, the only people in the apple of God's eye were enslaved by the colored race of Egypt. You don't hear that taught in the schools, do you? That's the truth. That's the Bible. And Paul speaking in 1 Timothy chapter 6, hey, listen, America may come under bondage again. The white man may become enslaved. Who? I don't know. It may happen. And Christians may have to give in to a master. And you better realize the Bible says there is your conduct before them. And it's to be a proper conduct. Right now it's an employee-employer relationship. Knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words. You know, they're not teaching doctrine. Whereof cometh envy? That's not a good thing. For envy did the, did the Pharisees, the Sadducees, bring Jesus to Pilate, Pilate said. And how do you know that that particular race of people just doesn't want what the white man had? I'll tell you what the white man gave. Gave him the God of the Bible. Strife, arguments, battles, riots, turmoil. That's not good. That's not God. Railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. They don't have no truth. So when you get these people that rise up that say rise up against your masters and all that, you need to study those people out and truly find out where they stand. Do they really stand under God? You mean their life? Their conduct? Their words? Don't rest on because they got a particular title. And then don't forget that Satan, 1st or 2nd Corinthians chapter 11, has his own ministers. And his ministers are not going to teach the truth that God's taught us through 1st Timothy chapter 6. They're going to teach otherwise. Perverse. Perverted. 
disputing. That's arguing. That's one of the things I've spoken about in, with the bishop. You're not to be disputing. You're not to be a brawler. No, get rid of that. But these men are. These men are so quick to get up with angry words of corrupt minds. Their, their mind is just filthy, perverted. It's what, destitute of the truth. They don't know the truth. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world. When your mother gave birth to you, she gave birth to a naked baby. Nothing came out but you and a bunch of... Ugh. That's all that came out with you. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. There is no U-Haul. There is no hiring movers. And what's the greatest doctrine, what is the greatest teaching that we see today of this fact is Egypt itself. When that pharaoh died, they put everything in his tomb. Well, where are all those things? They're in museums. There are somebody who, who looted those areas. They're in people's living rooms, in dens, and all over the world. You can't take it with you. Those pharaohs set up the... All this stuff is going to be the afterlife. The afterlife is death for the flesh. Unless those pharaohs believe that on God and, his, and what he prescribed, which many of them did not, they're in hell and they're not getting nothing of all the riches that their body was buried with. And so when you hear they found this tomb of such and such and all the treasures, that proves to you, guess what? You can't take it with you. And you got people today, they'll be buried with their cars. They'll be buried with their, in the coffin itself. There's a drawer you can lock. And you can put precious valuables in that drawer. And ain't going to do you no good. Because first of all, and I got the guy laughing when I talked about buying a coffin. There's two problems with that lockbox. Number one, if you want that treasure... When you close that lid, you can't get to it. So how are you going to get to it? And number two, it takes a key. Do you bury the person with the key? You don't. And that guy looked at me like, I never thought of that. Okay, then he takes the stuff out and the well, he takes, I'm just saying, for the dead body. It's like. You were just surprised that you figured it out. Yeah. And, and then another thing is. There's a hole in the casket. And what they do is they pump all the air out. Well, now you got a vacuum. Now you can't open the lid because you've got dirt. It's a vacuum. The, the, the safe deposit box is inside the coffin itself. And it's locked. And they don't give you the key. You're not going to do nothing with it. And pharaohs of Egypt, all they taught us was, go ahead, bury yourself with it. And you ain't going to enjoy it. So you can't, so the bumper sticker that says he with the most toys in the end, is dead. And Solomon tells us in Proverbs, you know what, you may leave it to your children, but your child may be a fool. You may have a child to take your inheritance, okay, you may do well with it. Or he may blow it in one afternoon. That man that told his father before his father died, let me have the inheritance. Not, man, he blew it. I don't know how long it took, but he blew it all. He came home ragged and broke. But there is one thing you can take with you to heaven. You can take yourself gold, silver, precious stone. I don't mean nuggets. I mean at the judgment seat of Christ. Lost souls that turn to Jesus Christ because you've done something. You can take that to glory. Everything that you've done for Jesus Christ will eternally last. You can take that. That goes to the heavenly uh, treasury. That's where Jesus said, where your heart is, is where your treasure will be. You can lay up in the heavenly account gold, silver, precious stone. But that's not something you're going to hold now. So he with, the, he with the most toys in the end is dead. And that's Bible. But let's get back to these perverse people because verse 6 says, but this is what they think. I skipped far. He is proud knowing nothing but 
those about with questions and strife of words, fighting. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmises, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. They don't know the truth. They don't know Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So if they're destitute of the truth, guess where they're going? Hell. Supposing that gain is godliness. What is that teaching? Well, if he's rich and wonderful, he's got to be God. And the world will treat them as gods. Well, look, God has given them great riches. God has given them great fame. And Satan can do that too. Satan told Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all this. So what they look at as far as salvation is someone's bank account, someone's riches. That don't count either. So you can have everything you want right here and have great riches and people look at you and they envy you. But listen, when you die, as we've already read, that ain't going to do you no good in death. You're still naked. You're still empty. And all those treasures, that gain, doesn't count for your salvation. Jesus told a, a parable of a rich man. He had all this great stuff. He's going to tear it down, rebuild new barns. And God said, thou fool, your soul tonight is going to be required. And everything that you plan to do and everything that you have right now is not going to save your soul. And what? look what Paul says to Timothy. From such... Withdraw thyself. You got somebody who's teaching rebellion against authority. Get away from them. They are wicked. They're not not saved. They're destitute of truth. And all they want to do is cause wickedness and sinfulness. And they're not of God. Get away from them. Withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Listen, if you're poor and you, you ain't got nothing and you're content, you can thank thank God for the meal that you got, even if it's not a great meal. Listen, that's a great game. Anything with God is a great game. Anything with Satan is a great loss. That poor widow that went in there through her two mites, she had great game with God. Everybody else was casting their abundance. They didn't get nothing. They didn't get no gratification from Jesus Christ. That widow woman got gratification from Jesus. No one else did. But we brought nothing to this world. Again, this gets back to godliness with his great gain. We brought nothing to this world, and it, shall, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. But gain all you want. It stays. And that's not salvation. Having food and raiment, nothing else. Let us be there with content. It doesn't say anything about cars, treasures, riches, food, eat, and clothing. When we left Adam and Eve in the garden and God drove them out, what did they have? They had clothing and they had food. But, now we're getting with the rich. We're still about the rich. They that will be rich. I want to be rich. I want to buy lottery tickets. I'm going to get rich. I'm going to have filthy riches. I'm going to have all this money. I'm going to have bank account. I'm going to be a CEO. I'm going to be my own boss. I fall into temptation and a snare they may do whatever needs to be done to gain those riches it could sell out their wife it could sell out their children it could sell out being a christian like they should be and the snare could be of men and of satan satan told jesus all you gotta do is fall down and worship me and i'll give it to you We are told you are not to be willed to be rich. It is, ought not to be your desire to be rich. 
be content. Because there's temptations and there's snares. Life holds temptation and snares. Don't let riches add more to it. And into many foolish and hurtful lust. You're going to spend that rich money on stupid, lustful things. You won't spend all that money just food and raiment. And if you do, you're going to buy excess of rain that does outrageous fees for raiment that, you know, it's an outfit. Why you spend all that money just for that outfit? That man who asked of his father's inheritance went, lost it all. And he had nothing to show for it. Nothing. I guarantee when he left, he was dressed fine. When he came home, he was in rags. He didn't even have shoes. Father said, put shoes on him. Which drowned men in destruction and perdition. So, what's this phrase? Drowning in debt. The more money you get, the more you're going to have to buy to get your money. He said, what are you talking about? you got to buy security systems now. you got to buy a safe box. you got to buy a, a, a vault in a bank. you got to get a security team. you got to hire armed guards. you got to have an armor. The more you get, the more you're going to have to spend. And then you're going to be in fear. They're going to steal my child and want a ransom. Or they're going to hurt my family. What, who's going to be after me? Who's going to try to take my stuff away from me? You're going to become unreliant of people thinking that everybody's going to be against you because you're rich and i guarantee that moment that you hit those numbers and it's announced over the television that mr smith has run the lottery you will now find out you've got more relatives that your family tree can ever hold and they'll be camping out from your door and they're not relatives they'll be buying you all kinds of snake oil, all kinds of gimmicks, all kinds of products and ventures that they thought of. You'll be the mark of swindlers. You will not have peace. You ever see what the President of the United States ends up? Go back and take the presidents. I forget how many we had. Take, the, take a picture of them when they first got in office. And then take a picture of them and look when they exit the office. Man, they change. There's a lot of work. And they don't even get a lot of money for the job that they do. There are more people that get more money than they get. And what you're going to do is you're going to come up with more ways to get more money because you're not going to be content with the money that you got. And you're going to displease people more and more because you're going to charge them for more and less product. You're going to find more ways for your product to cost more and give them less so you get more. That's called American productism. You're not going to be a happy camper with money. Drowning in debt. For the love of money. The love is taken out. Everyone tells you money is the root of all evil. Money is nothing. Money is like a gun. Unless you put your finger to the trigger, it ain't going to kill anybody. Somebody's got to take those bullets and put it in the chamber. Somebody's got to pull the trigger. Money itself, you can leave money on the table. Money you can find in a tomb of, of an Egyptian. It ain't going to do nothing all those years until somebody finds it, takes it, and misblows it. The love of money. And that love of money goes with the will to be rich. You will escape your family if your God is money. I know this offhand. When your money is your God, you will complain. All they want, all they ask for, every time they contact me, every time they call me, all they want is money, money, money. And it may not be true. 
But your sole desire is when you walk into a church, all they want is money. And all they preach about money, money, money. You lie. The love of money is the root of all evil. When you love money, it becomes a root. And that root, Psalms chapter 1, is an evil root. The love of money is you will treat anybody worse off. You will be uncontented. You will do anything you will have to do to get more money. It's almost as bad as being addicted to heroin. Where that guy's got to go rob and steal to get more money to get more heroin. This guy is going to do all he can do to get more money. Is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted, that's a sin. Some covered it after. They have erred from the faith. Timothy, when these men in your in your church preach to them, to save individuals, preach to them what money can do to a saved person. Money for a saved person will cause a man that is saved to err from the faith. If he sets desire on it, and if he to love that money, Mark it down, he will err from doctrine. That's what Paul said. They have erred from the faith. They're saved. But they left the faith. And pierced themselves through with many sorrow. They cut themselves. And that is forbidden in the Old Testament. You're not to make carvings and cuttings upon the flesh. Today... They'll get money. A teenager will get this money. What do you do? He'll go start getting the stuff that he sticks in his body. He wastes his money on, on jewelry for the body. Pierced himself. It's called body piercing. And it's stupid. And it's stupid. And it's stupid. It's a waste of money. But money, the more you get that you love and you want and you can't get none of it, the more you're piercing yourself. The more you're going to put yourself in trouble. The more you're going to get away from God. The more you're going to pull your family away. The more you're going to pull your church away. Did your love will turn to the money. Pierce himself through many sorrows. You don't see the life of these rich people when they're alone and the cameras are off. The Bible says sorrows. But thou, O man of God, Timothy, flee these things. Get away from the love of money. Get away from people who are going to preach, don't listen to your boss. Get away from rebellion. Get away from sin. And follow after righteousness. Find what is righteousness and follow it. Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Timothy, get this stuff, stay with it, love it, hug it, embrace it. Everything else, get rid of. Fight the good fight of faith. Uh-oh, you mean to live as a Christian, it's a fight? You better believe it. You got Satan in the world and other Christians are after you. You got your own flesh giving you trouble. Your own flesh, we've already read. Paul wrote to the church, your flesh and your spirit, they are enmity against each other. That's a fight. Even myself, when I want to do something for the Lord, the flesh is like, uh-uh. It's like, flesh, shut up. Uh-uh. Shut up. And then when the flesh wants to do something, the spirit says, no. Fight the good fight of faith. Oh, that's a good fight of faith. Not a boxing ring, not your spouse, not your children, not conflict of others as we already read verses 1 through 5. But there's the good fight of faith. What is that? It's simple. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. That's a fight to do right. 
because your flesh does not want that. Lay hold on eternal life, not money. Do everything for the treasures of glory. Lay up for your heavenly bank account. And God will give you little nuggets of gold and silver on the earth. I'm not saying a lot, but he'll give you blessings. But lay up for heaven, as Jesus said. Whereunto thou art also called eternal life. To fight the, you are called to fight. You are called to eternal life. Now get that armor on and fight. Don't rest. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now Timothy is a remarkable man. Timothy has a good report of all. Including Paul. Now let's be like Timothy. I give thee charge in the sight of God. Joshua gave a lot of charges. It's orders. Here are your orders. We're in the military. Orders. Who quickeneth all things, make alive. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Pontius Pilate found no fault in anything of Jesus Christ. Timothy, be like Jesus. Because you already got a good profession among many witnesses. So like car insurance, a Christian is to be no fault. And they're going to say anything about you. Let it be a lie of Satan. John 8 44 we're to be like Christ Christ is our example right yes correct so what was his example before the judge I find no fault in him but I'm still gonna beat him I find no fault in him okay we'll crucify him what did they crucify Jesus for absolutely nothing but the Word of God So if you're going to be condemned to capital punishment, let it be for the word of God and they can't find no fault in you. That thou, Timothy, keep this commandment without spot. Don't spot the message. Don't change it. Don't spoil. Don't put polka dots. Don't have white lies and black lies. Unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, Timothy, you know Jesus is coming. Paul knew Jesus is coming. He didn't come yet. He's coming. So let's carry that over to us today. Let's be unrebukable. Let's be without spot until Jesus comes. And if Jesus doesn't come into our time and he tarries, let's teach our children to do it. Because Timothy is a child of Paul, spiritual. Paul's spiritual son. Jesus is coming and the church today lives like he's not. You realize how many people, Christians, if Jesus were to come right now, would be upset? That he ruined their plans. Which in his times. He, sh he shall show. Who is the blessed. The happiest of all happy. The only potentate. King, prince, monarch. He'll dethrone the queen in England. He'll put down the president of the United States. He'll put down Putin, because I don't know what, what his title is. All the worldly government officials, including Satan, Jesus will put down. Jesus will take the government and tell Satan, now you bow down before me while I put you in chains. That's coming at the second advent of Jesus Christ, because look, 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 the king of kings. That's not the rapture. 
That's Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back on horseback and we follow. And he sets up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. There will be, when Jesus comes back at the millennium, there will be no governments against him. They will all be put to the lake of fire. Satan will be bound in chains for a thousand years. Revelation 1 says we're kings. We're priests and kings. Some of us will get the reign in the millennium. We'll be kings. And the king of our, us, the king of us who are kings, is Jesus Christ, the king of kings. That's us. And Lord of lords. I don't know who the lords would be, but he'll be the Lord of the lords. That's the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. If I get a reign, I'll be a king. Jesus will be the king of me, over me. That's at his appearing. That's at the second advent. When Jesus comes back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Anger. Ferocious. Killing. Bloodshed. Then he sets up his government. So we're to want the rapture and we're to want the second coming of Jesus Christ. Who, Jesus, only has immortality... Dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. Whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and glory and power everlasting. Amen. Now, what man has seen Jesus Christ at his second advent? Absolutely none yet. The Bible says that at the seventh year of the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, the moon will go dark, the sun will not give her light. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see this light coming like a like a train coming out of a tunnel. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. The Bible says that the men of the earth, they're going to take their gods. They're going to throw them into the caves. They're going to go into the cave. They're going to say to the rocks, fall on us. Let us escape from that one that is coming, Jesus. It's funny how they, they can't see who he is, but they know who he is. And they know their sin. And all the people that persecuted will be coming right behind him. Charge them, give an order, that are rich in this world. Paul had a little commercial break here and he gets right back to the rich. Wait a minute. Jesus Christ is coming. Amen. Glory to God. Timothy, you be like you're supposed to be, righteous, perfect, and all of Jesus Christ, like Jesus Christ gave the good report and was found. Oh, wait a minute, let's talk about the rich people. I haven't finished about them, did I? <laughs> Timothy, you be okay, you be right. That was a Paul little monkey trail, and he, he comes right back to being rich again. So monkey trails are great. Paul did it. Charge them that are rich in this world. Uh oh. J.C. Penny, the man that started and owned J.C. Penny's store, was a born again Christian. You can do a Google search. There were many rich men. There, there, there were men that would, God would give them companies. And one company he would tithe. Another company he had, he would give all the profits of that company to missionary. This, this is other men. This is not J.C. Penny. I don't know the full story of J.C. Penny. But there were men who were rich. They did not will to be rich. God blessed them being rich because they blessed God by giving. And God made them richer because they were found faithful. But they did not love the money. They gave it to God and God over, overcasted them with riches and glory. That they be not high-minded. Get your head out of the clouds. Don't be lofty. Don't be prideful. Be humble. Or you'll stumble. This country called America has been blessed with great riches. The resources of this country is great that we feed and give money to other nations. We do that. We help. We're Japheth. We help Ham and we help Shem all around the world. But we've taken a little prideful uh, approach to that. We've been in our clouds. We've been very lofty. 
And God says, don't be like that. Because the Bible says, you know what? Be humble before you stumble. Nor trust in uncertain riches. What's the dollar bill going to do when Jesus comes? Absolutely nothing. What's the stock market going to do when a doctor tells you it's terminal and there's absolutely nothing we can do for it? It ain't going to do you nothing. What are you going to do when, when your children are cast off in the lake of fire that have not believed in Jesus? Nothing. The only certain riches there are is Jesus Christ, the righteousness. Because why? But in the living God. Trust in, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And if God sees you faithful to be rich, he'll, he'll make you rich. Don't get prideful of it. Don't be lofty. But still rely on God. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Everything we've got has come from God. Do you thank God? Do you bless God? Do you rejoice in God? Or do you think you did it? That you're worthy of it? That you're entitled to it? That they do good. And they be rich in good works. Watch this one. Ready to dis distribute. I really like that one. You think a man with worldly treasures with a worldly mind be ready to distribute? Unless his, unless his accountant said, well, if you get a certain amount, we can put it on your IS form. Willing to communicate, have a good life with your riches. When God orders the books on your riches and it's been proper and right. Gold, silver, or precious stone. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation, that's Jesus Christ, against the time to come. What's that? Jesus is coming. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. Use your money for eternal rewards, not for lust and pleasures of this earth, which do you no good. That they may lay hold on eternal life. Eternal life is wrought in Jesus Christ. Be able to have a crown and be able to throw it down at Jesus' feet. Oh, Timothy. Look at that. Oh, Timothy. I don't think Timothy was rich. I think he's got rich people in his congregation because why would Paul teach this? Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Keep it. What you've been, what you're going to be entrusted with the people in Ephesians, wherever ministry I send you to. Keep that which is God. Keep remember the laying on the hands. What I've written you, what I've taught you, what your grandma has taught you, what your mom has put into your heart. Trust that. Keep it. Avoid profane and vain babblings. That's the second time Paul said it. And it's found in Titus 1.14. Opposition of science, falsely so-called, lies. Evolution is a big lie. It's science falsely. So even in the time of Titus, A.D. 65, I don't know what they were teaching, but evolution has been around a lot longer than Charlie Darwin. Run back to Daniel chapter 1 verse 4 and you find science. Science was connected with the magicians, was connected with the heavenly host. I have a dream. Please tell me what, what, what the interpretation of the dream is. Science, when it goes against God in the Bible, is a lie. Which some professing professors, why do they call themselves professors? Because the Bible said, you find this in Romans chapter 1 have erred concerning the faith. Now, they're not in the faith. They've erred. In other words, what the Bible says, they've gone against and erred to what the Bible says for their science. You say, what's the difference like that? You get a saved man in a public school and he teaches evolution to the students because he wants the paycheck. All right, he's erred through the faith. 
He's saved, but for the money, he'll teach evolution, but he believes God. You get an unsaved man in a college teaching evolution. He doesn't believe in God. And he's going to teach what he believes. And he is heir from the faith of Jesus Christ and God the Creator. That's a big heir. Grace be with thee. Amen. And he closes the letter off. And we've got a lot of things in 1 Timothy about the ministry, about the people, about the minister, about the objects of people coming and trying to destroy, about money, who and what of the ministry is what Timothy is about. 